So I'm really here to, to see if I can help you move from the projects that you're doing into a publishable paper. Um, so I'd love any questions as we go along, um, so feel free to slow me down or stop. But the objectives for this particular talk are, are at the end of the talk for you to be able to describe the steps for publishing uh, scholarly papers, to cite the sections of a good paper. We're going to do a little bit of practice writing based on the kinds of projects that you're currently working on. So um, be ready to do a little bit of writing or typing. Um, and then finally, to summarize ways of facilitating and finding time for scholarly writing, because that seems to always be a huge sticking point uh, for people who are trying to be productive. So why should you publish? The main reason, I think, is because it's important to our profession to develop and disseminate new information. So we have an obligation being part of the academic community to get information out there. It also tends to stimulate discussion um, and produces new ideas. Um, usually a good question will generate lots more questions that it actually answers at the end of the day, and that's good. Um, it's also your academic credential. So if you stay in an academic arena, um, it is publications of the academic currency for promotion. Uh, I get a lot of personal satisfaction, and what I'm going to try and do today is generate the sense that this is actually fun to do this kind of work. Um, so, steps for publishing. Probably the most important first step is to complete your study, have it be of a sound design, and have some unique feature. So, it is fine to do work that uh, is quality improvement work, that is work that takes stuff we know from the literature, like a protocol for giving vaccinations that we know works, a nursing protocol, and putting it into your clinic and watching the rates of vaccination in, improve. So that's good work, it's worth doing, but it's not likely going to be published because there isn't anything unique about what you're doing. Um, so if you're going to get something published, you have to have a unique population that you've used, some aspect of the study that is novel um, so that it will be more likely um, to get into the literature. Any other thoughts from folks? Yeah? Okay. The second is to make it less onerous, you should write as you go. Um, one of the difficulties I think people have in getting their work out is that when they finally get to the end of a study and they've analyzed the data, they're exhausted. I mean, there's a huge amount of effort that goes in, um, most of the effort up front, and then you get to the end of the day and it's like, ah, you've already moved on several different ways. Um, so it's hard to get back to this. But if you write the paper as you go, all you have to do at the end is a little bit of discussion, filling in your tables, and maybe updating your introduction a little bit, and you're done. So you can make it much easier and really facilitate for yourselves in getting the writing part done if you write as you go. So when might you write? So when are you best up on your methods, for example? Yes? Well, when you're putting together your protocol. Exactly. When you're putting together your protocol and submitting to the IRB. So that is the time when you know your methods inside and out and you've written them up and all you need to do is slide them into the paper. And that section is done. You know, when you work with your statistician on setting up your study, on talking about, you already know what that section on data analysis needs to look like. And you plug it in. You also already know what kind of data you're going to get back. So you could set up your tables. You know, you already know table one, which is what's usually table one? The demographics of your population. Um, and then maybe the descriptive statistics on what you've done. But usually it's, so you can already set it up. You know which the fields are that you're going to present in your table. Um, if you have a really interesting, intriguing protocol, you might have a flow diagram. Put it in. You know, so those kinds of things can happen very early in the process. Um, anytime you're telling someone about your study, when are you most excited about the study? Well, sometimes it's when you're setting it uh, to the IRB. Otherwise, it's when it first goes into the field that you're just all charged. So that's when your enthusiasm is greatest, and you know why the topic's important, why you want to know this. You are really wedded to this kind of stuff. Introduction just sort of flows out with that knowledge. 
Um, and we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. So there are, there's lots you can do up until the discussion, and even then you know what your study limitations are likely to be. Um, so you could actually put in pieces of that too. Okay, pick a journal. Pick a journal early that you plan on submitting. How do you decide on which journal is going to be the best journal for you? Okay, so if you look in your reference list, the articles you've been citing are often wonderful places for where your article is going to find a home because the journal is already interested. Uh, and the other is to find where the readership is. Who do you want to consume your information? So that would be a journal that you would look at. Uh, of the journals, sometimes you want to order them in terms of impact. So you'd want to go with where the journal might have the highest, that has the highest impact factor. The journal that cited the most, where your, your um, article might have the biggest splash when it comes out. You want to then read some of the papers that are in that journal so that you have a template, you have an idea about the style, the kinds of things that they like to see, the formatting um, will give you a really good idea. Uh, and then finally, you want to follow instructions for authors uh, because each journal has a little bit of a unique format. Sometimes the references are in a certain way. Some like you to indicate where to insert tables or figures. Some don't. They just want it all at the end. Um, there is always a limit on words, on the words in the abstract, all of those things. And they're part of instructions for authors. Um, and you can find those easily when you go on to the journal. There will be a little section for instructions for authors. Um, and it's really important because if you do not do this step, then someone will assume that your paper was submitted and rejected from someone else and that you just turned it around and sent it in. So it's a way of being a little bit more meticulous about making sure that you have all your ducks in a row. It makes the reader and the editor happy and you want a happy person reading your paper. And then you write the paper. And the papers generally have four sections. There's an introduction, a methods, results, and discussion. I mean, this is all old news to you. What I'm hoping that you go away with is a way of getting this to happen in a, um, its most potentially successful format. Once you do the paper, I really strongly recommend that you put it away and not look at it for at least a few days. Because once you've worked with the paper for a while, you don't even read the words anymore. You know, you're so familiar, you're almost hearing the words rather than reading them. So then pull it out again after you've it sat for a week or so, read it again and make it shorter. Even if you think you can't possibly do it, make it shorter because you always end up with redundant material, things that aren't quite so snappy or interesting. And then ask somebody to review it for you inside your institution. So, um, and even if it's a colleague, that's fine. A colleague who knows nothing about your area, that's fine. What you want is to know if the flow is going well, if people are coming away with your main messages. Um, if you have an experienced reviewer, that's even better. Um, and the more marked up, frankly, the better, the, per the more invested the person is in helping you. So you do really don't want something coming back where they say, nice work. You know, my mother could do that for you. So if you really need that kind of enthusiasm, let me know and we can send it to my mom. But if you want some critique, have an internal reviewer. Uh, then revise the paper, but only if you agree. So don't change your words if you really feel like you've gotten what you want across. Let the actual reviewers give you some feedback. And then submit your paper. The editorial process is as follows. There's an automatic rejection of some of the papers. The bigger the journal, the faster, the bigger this group of automatic rejections. But usually this is because it wasn't in the format. It was way too long, it wasn't, or it was off topic. It's not a topic that they've ever published before. So if you sent in a clinical review article to Family Medicine when I was working as the associate editor there, we would send it right back because we don't publish that kind of work. So if it's a case report to a journal that doesn't do case reports, it's going to come around pretty quickly. Um, so don't make that mistake. Know that the paper is at least appropriate and in the appropriate format, and you won't fit into that category of automatic rejection. Then the papers are sent out for review. And there are usually at least two reviewers. There's a topic expert and a member of the editorial review board who is going to look at your paper and critique it. And so that you will get comments back from those individuals. Sometimes there's, there are more reviewers if the topic is really difficult or very highly statistical. They may, might go somewhere else. But generally, it's a couple of people who review. 
within three or four weeks, they'll send the reviews back. So you should hear on your paper within about three months or so, depending on the journal. Um, and then an editorial decision is made. About two-thirds to three-quarters are rejected. Okay, the paper is rejected for a number of reasons. And often it's because there was a recent paper like it, the study design wasn't all that tight, you know, there were some issues with the paper, um, some of the reviewers were pretty negative, so there's a lot of reasons. It doesn't mean that your paper is fatally flawed, it's just that you fit into the majority. Okay, so I've been rejected from some of the best uh, journals in the country. You know, and so that's not a bad thing. It just means that you shot high and they didn't take it. There will be a home, but only if you resubmit it. So this is where a lot of people fall down, is that they get so deflated from that first rejection. So know that most papers are rejected from the first journal. Okay, if you go for New England Journal or JAMA, they're rejecting 98% of what they get. So you're also in a very prestigious group if you're rejected from those kinds of papers. <laughs> uh, then go ahead and revise and resubmit. Um, and so some, some of the articles then are revise and resubmit. If you get a revise and resubmit notice, you should celebrate. Because usually it means that they're going to take your paper, but you have to fix it up a little bit. So it's unusual for you to hook them and then for them to let you off the hook. Um, so follow the comments that the reviewers send to you, revise it, get it back in. And I would encourage you to do that within a two to three month framework. Often they want it in sooner, you know, and they'll let you know if there's a time frame, but don't let it sit, get it, get it back. And then a few are accepted. And if you get your paper immediately accepted, you might as well retire because it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> so what should your response be? If you're rejected, we allow you to briefly wallow in the injustice of it all. <laughs> you then, however, should read the comments. You can appeal, I don't recommend it. Um, sometimes you get a really one crappy review and the other reviewer thought it was wonderful. It's probably not worth it, but you could say that this one reviewer was really grumpy um, and can they re-look at it. Um, otherwise, revise it according to the comments you got because they'll always make it a little better even if you're not going back for the same journal. And then reformat it and then send it in. And again, don't let stuff sit. The longer you let a paper that's been rejected sit, the less likely it is to go. And that probably cuts off dramatically after the first three months that you will never revisit that paper. And after all of the time and energy, you really shouldn't let that happen. Um, okay, if you get a revise and resubmit, celebrate, read, the comments, discuss them in your group if you've got a group working with you, revise it if you agree, and then write an explanatory letter so that the editor wants to know, particularly if you didn't do something, the reviewer said why you didn't do it. Um, but it's fine if you have a reasonable explanation or if you, it was just the wording wasn't clear, then clarify it and then resubmit it. And again, if you get accepted, you might as well retire. So, sections of a scholarly paper. Introduction. The introduction should be about three paragraphs. How many paragraphs should the introduction be? About three. So, first paragraph, why is the topic important? This is a why should I care? So, one of the questions we always ask is, what's the point? Why do I care about this paper? Okay, the second is, what are the gaps in the literature? So, why do we need your particular tool? Um, and this is sort of the transition between why the topic's important and what you're actually doing. That's what links them. We don't know about how best to do shared decision making. We don't really know what numbers we're talking about, so we can't put in place strategies to pick these kids up and treat them. So whatever it is, and then that leads directly into the purpose of my study is to develop such a tool, test such a tool identify, you know, do case finding. So whatever it is, these three things lead into each other. But big problem, these are the things that have been tried, but we really don't know how to address the big problem. I think I have an important piece of the puzzle. Okay, three paragraphs. How many paragraphs is the introduction? Three. <laughs> okay, method section. The method section often begins with an overview of what your study is just to help set the stage. You don't have to have this section. Um, but sometimes it's nice to know that we're going to be looking at a survey or we're going to be doing a randomized clinical trial or this is a qualitative 
interview study, uh, just to help us sort of get oriented to where we're going. Um, sample and setting, who are you studying and where are you doing it? Um, what instruments are you using? And if you're doing an educational research paper, how many of you have done some educational research work? Not, not too many. Um, but if you're testing a curricula, you know, a piece of curriculum, um, then this would be the section where your program description would be. So what kinds of bells and whistles do you have in your intervention? Uh, the procedures is the next section, which is how are you going about your study? So this is the cookbook piece, and it should be as clear as a cookbook. So at the end of it, I should be able to bake the same cake that you're baking in your program. If you're doing an educational piece, this is where the program evaluation piece comes. And then data analysis. Data analysis is probably the single most forgotten section in a manuscript um, because people just sort of assume that they've told you about the data they're collecting, that you kind of know what analysis is going to be applied, but we don't. So I would like to see that you're using, if you're using Likert scales, for example, or APGAR scores, for example, that you're using the appropriate statistic to compare. This is a personal little pet peeve of mine, so I usually elaborate just a little bit on it. So APGAR score is ordinal. It's ordered data. It's not interval data like blood pressure. So the difference between one unit and the next is not the same as you go up the scale. It's ordered. So an APGAR of 1 to 2, is that the same as 9 to 10? Not even close. So if you're using an ordinal scale, there are different kinds of statistics that you apply to those to see whether there's a rank order change as you do one intervention or another. So you really shouldn't use things like t-tests. So there are appropriate statistics in that analysis section is how we figure out if you know what you're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing, just have a biostatistician holding your hand so that you can say the right words. Um, how many of you are doing chart review pieces in your proposals? Okay, we have one. Um, I find it particularly important to at least touch on the problems that occur with chart reviews. Chart reviews are a really common um, early study method that lots of people use, um, our learners in particular. And so these are things that you should put in place in your protocols when you're doing studies that involve chart reviews. Um, and that's training of abstractors, that you should have illicit, uh, explicit protocols for your case selection. Make sure that you carefully define your variables and where you're collecting those variables. Um, monitor data collection, so we recommend that you abstract twice, at least on a small percentage, so that you know that you're getting data that are, are reliable. That you blind reviewers to the study condition because we tend to cheer each other on. So if I know you're looking for respiratory infections, I'm going to be really diligent and maybe find things that aren't there. Um, and that you test the interrater agreement if you have more than one person doing your abstracting. So those are little steps. Yes? I would imagine these are the same steps if you have coders coding the Yes, these are the same steps if you have coders coding your transcripts. So. These are things that you ought to think about as you're developing your protocols. And then certainly these should appear in the write-up, which will help people see that you've approached this with some degree of rigor. OK, results. So I encourage people to use tables and figures um, very liberally, um, although some journals have a limit to how many you can use. So you need to pay attention to that as well. Uh, but you don't want a lot of numbers in your text. Um, numbers are difficult to read. They make things very dry and boring, so you really want to make sure that you use tables and figures where appropriate. But results sections always include information on either demographics or your participation rate. You should immediately answer the main question. So we shouldn't have to dig around in the results to find out what it is that you found. If you're doing a qualitative piece, this also would appear then in your results section as themes. Um, so if you wanted to know about participant burden for this and you actually put a focus group, group together and you elicited information about what was most burdensome, um, what facilitated, you would then list those themes and have quotes that would support the themes. This sometimes makes your results section huge and unwieldy. And so I usually recommend to people when they're doing this kind of work that you put, make a table where your themes are there and then the highlighting quotes and not put most of that into your text. 
you highlight the major themes and then refer to your table where all those wonderful quotes. And I think quotes are really important, um, but it makes a result section huge. So these are just examples of tables, um, not intended for you to actually read them, but just to know what things sort of look like so that numbers like this are not glomming up your text. You might use some graphics, and that's fine too. So the question is about digital content and um, how we feel about that. Um, it varies by journal, and there probably are, is information in the instructions to authors as to how amenable they are to including that. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. We often have things in an appendix that only appear digitally and not um, in print. Um, if it's core to understanding the paper or it's a key result, it should be in the paper. It should be somewhere that everybody has access to it. If it's an ancillary piece, the whole protocol, um, those kinds of things, I think that is appropriate for digital content or you know people being able to get it a different way. Um, so, but in general, I think you should take the important pieces and make sure they're an inherent part of the paper or the tables and figures. So, in response to reviewers, you might add those kinds of things, and then the editor would de determine whether or not to include them in the paper or have them a hot link to, to them somewhere. Um, okay, qualitative papers. There is uh, one of you is doing a qualitative um, piece, and so I wanted to make some um, mention of important things to think about when you have primarily a qualitative design. The first is in, in your introduction, you should somewhere say why a qualitative approach was needed. Okay, so it's still the same, topic's important, what are the gaps in the literature, what did I do, what was the purpose of my study, but at some point you want to say why you picked qualitative methodology, and it's usually because it's exploratory, we really don't know what's out there, um, and so we don't want to shift the, the conversation until we really understand the components of it. In the methods, you want to make sure that you use the same kind of rigor that you would use in any quantitative piece, um, but you also want to acknowledge biases. So it's really important when you're, you're moving into a qualitative endeavor that you identify um, what your positions are among your group so that you have a sense as you're interpreting where, what lens you're using to interpret the data. And this just helps you to stay a little bit more true to the data. Um, and it's more important in these than it is in quantitative because it's easier to play with what you hear and pulling out themes with what you read through a, a given lens uh, than it is if you're just getting numbers back from a survey. Um, when you're talking about sample selection, it's important to say why are you using key informants? How did you come up with these, this group? Um, the process then is usually an iterative process that changes a little bit as you go. Your script changes a little, your prompts might change. So you want to just track that through the paper to say what happened. Um, Usually people record and transcribe um, information that they gain from qualitative interviews or focus groups. Um, often an, an area that adds some rigor is using someone who takes field notes. So having an extra person there. The role of that person is often to watch what's happening in the group so that they can report back when things got uncomfortable, when a certain set of people might have set back a little bit, gotten much quieter, things that you can't get in the transcripts that, but that might really help you understand what's happening in, a, in something like a focus group. Um, I haven't seen field notes in an interview setting, but I've seen them used mostly in, in focus groups. Um, and the other thing that I don't, um, um, well, I'll talk about in the analysis, you, you stop when you reach saturation, which means that when you stop hearing new information, you're done. So often people starting out wonder, well, how many subjects do I need? And the answer is, you can only ballpark it because you don't know until you're not hearing anything new. And that may happen after four or five people, or it may not happen until 10 or 15 people. It's usually a small number. Um, so that's a good part because these are, can be quite labor intensive. Uh, but you want to say in the methods that you go till you reach saturation. Um, analysis. You need to decide if you're using a priori categories or if the themes are emerging from the data. Those are words that a qualitative person is going to expect to see in your paper. 
Uh, you want to have multiple reviewers of the, of the transcripts or the data recordings. You'd like to ha have some process by which you either reach consensus or talk about the information. And then it's nice if you're doing a group that you go back and do some member checking to make sure that what you're finding sounds like what happened uh, to the people who are participating. So all of those are things that help to add rigor to a qualitative piece that you want to be thinking about as you're developing your protocols, but certainly have in place when you're reporting on your findings and the methods. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, the results, make sure that you use tables for the quotes and don't try to put too much into the text because it makes it very unwieldy. So discussion, you state your main findings. So once again, you just say very simply what you found, the key points. You then ground it in the literature. So how does the evidence from the literature support your conclusions or conflict with them? So this is often a very interesting area that you can have more fun with because you'd like to see what, where your piece of the puzzle fits in the larger whole. Um, it's when you get to go back in the literature, it's when you sort of bring things forward where you can really think about what, what I found and what it means. And it's only a paragraph or two, so we won't, don't want you to go on longer than, and one guideline is it shouldn't be a lot longer than your results. So if your results were a page, you don't want your discussion to go on for four pages. Um, then talk about limitations, your study limitations, all of us have them. But don't list a huge number of limitations, because then the reviewer is going to be saying, God, this is terrible. Why do I want to publish this? You know, they've got 27 limitations. Just hit on the major few and add a little qualifier about why you think it's not a fatal flaw. So yeah, we only had this many subjects, but they look just like this national sample. So we have no reason to believe that our program looks any different than other programs. Um, so add a little bit about why you don't think it's a fatal flaw. But be honest about your limitations, and, um, and they are what they are. Um, suggest implications, what you're going to do with this information in the future. So if you come up with this wonderful decision tool, what are you going to do next? Um, short, short. Don't go on and on. Uh, and then summarize again. So when you're working with a patient in the clinic, how many times should you repeat your message before the patient gets it? So what do you think? How many times do you usually say to them how to take a particular drug? You just give it one, three. OK, so that's how many times I want you to tell us what you found. So in the beginning, in the introduction, you're going to tell us what you're looking for. That's one. In the results, you tell us what you found. That's two. And then in the discussion, you tell us your main findings and you summarize. That's actually four. So. You tell us three times what you found and set the stage in the introduction. And that's usually what we're looking for. So questions on what you should put into a paper? OK. So now what we're going to do is try to practice a little bit. Um, so what I'd like you to do is put up your hand um, and volunteer a little bit for telling me why your topic's important. So we did a little bit of that. So. Um, so I had an example of exercise intervention during pregnancy. Yeah, the importance, you know, wasn't really evident. Um, so that's the importance. The gap that you're filling is we don't know if exercise is going to work in this particular area. So the purpose of our study is to explore associations between physical activity behaviors and mental health during pregnancy. So. You need to set your stage and then go. OK, results. So this is the big splash. Um, so this is uh, usually, as we said, the format of the demographics. So here, what you want to do is start setting the stage for yourself as you're doing your projects to get things ready for the big splash. Um, so what important comparisons might you be making? So discussion again, state your main finding. How does the literature support or refute it? So bring your literature back in. And then at least two limitations and why they're not fatal flaws is in your discussion. Let's spend just a little bit of time looking at titles. So how do you decide on the title to your paper? Do you want to tease a little bit, or do you want to be an informative kind of title? 
So I would encourage you as you're thinking about your titles, because this is what's going to catch people to stop, that you use informative but with words that are powerful. So critical, innovative, um, and but I in general tend to like to see informative titles. So a title that tells me what I'm likely to see in the paper. Um, abstracts, just a note, quick note on abstracts. You will all have to do these for your paper. And this is usually all people read. They rarely will get into your paper unless they're interested in that particular field. They need to know it. They're looking to cite your paper. Um, so you need to pay very close attention to your abstracts, and that's a whole nother talk. But one, pay attention to the word count. Because usually a journal will say they want 100 words, 250, or 300, and that's usually about what they want. Pay attention to whether they want structured abstracts or more free flow. Uh, I like structured just because that's the kind of person I am. Um, and then they'll tell you the categories that they want to see, which are usually background methods, results, and discussion. Um, make sure that you just use your main punchline in your results. Um, because again, that's all people are going to read. The 90% will only read your abstract. So make sure your key finding is front and center, and then conclude only what you found. So make sure that you don't conclude. So for example, I had a nutrition paper. They did this wonderful, very intensive nutrition intervention, found no difference. So their conclusion was nutrition education is really important. Like, yes, but unrelated to your finding. Your finding was, this is not the way to deliver it. So that's what you should conclude. Nutrition is important, but this particular intervention didn't work. OK. All right, a few tips for facilitating writing. We did a study um, of our fellows uh, from Michigan State University a few years ago, more now, um, about why the papers that they had prepared, the studies they'd completed, never got into print. And these were the reasons. Lack of time was the big one. Paper was rejected, and they never resubmitted it. Sorry, can you see? OK. Um, the paper was never finished, and uh, they didn't have enough help. It wasn't a personal goal of theirs. It wasn't a program expectation, and so they sort of let it drop, um, or left the position, or had problems with co-authors. Were much smaller number, but the big ones were lack of time, and the paper was rejected. Okay, so what helps us with those kinds of issues? We have many facilitators, and those include our environments, our colleagues, the training that we might have or need, and then prior success. So in terms of the research environment, mentors can be very helpful. Resources can be helpful. Expectations is probably the most helpful if somebody expects that you're going to be doing this. And then rewards for doing it. Sometimes you get sent to meetings um, to present your work, uh, or you get recognition for it. So the research environment is really critical to your success as an academic physician. So pay attention to what your environment is like when you're choosing your next location. Uh, or deciding to stay where you are. Collegial relationships, how does this relate to publication? I only have a little bit of data, but what we found in our study is that to get that first publication, the most important thing was to have a mentor. To get the next publication, it was your peers. So to have good collegial relationships with peers actually helped you to become a productive researcher. Um, Training, you might need more training. You're obviously getting some training now, so that uh, helps. When I started in my job, um, I had no training, and so I went back and did a master's degree in research design and statistical analysis. So sometimes you need a little bit more training to be able to do what you need to do. Recognize it and then go find it. There are lots of avenues now for getting additional training. And then the one thing that I do know is that Success breeds success. So writing that first word encourages all the other little words to follow. So I'd encourage you to get stuff down on paper because it encourages other things to happen. But what do you do about the time thing? OK, um, I can't tell you how to create more time. I've been working on it for many, many years. And I still only find 24 hours in a day. Um, so write as you go. Write about what you do, first of all. Don't pick topics that are completely foreign to what you do every day, because that makes it really difficult to get moving on things. Um, so write about what you do. So if you're preparing a lecture, 
maybe that could be a review article for someone. So you know, think about doing what you do, only doing it on paper as well. Uh, write as you go, as I mentioned. When you put in that IRB, you're in the best position to write your method section. Um, when you're doing your data collection, you might be working on the introduction or setting up your tables. Um, so do it as you go, and it becomes much less onerous. Prioritize writing. Make it important. Um, don't always tuck it into the wee hours of the night, uh, although sometimes that is the best time. Um, schedule writing if you can. Try to minimize the tasks by having a group. So have a group that you work with so that somebody can be working on the introduction, somebody can work, be working on a different piece of the paper. Give up something. Some, sometimes you have to put things aside, um, and that you can negotiate with program directors, with your chair, um, that, you know, I'm not getting this done. I really want to do this, so I may have to not do so much teaching, or I may have to, and it's just for now. You know, you can, one of the nice things about an academic career is it's pretty flexible. And sometimes some things are more important than others. Uh, and the other is sometimes you're the per, a kind of person who needs a block uh, of time rather than doing things piecemeal. Um, so if you are, figure out where you can put the blocks, and they shouldn't be in your vacation. Um, sometimes you can negotiate with your chair or program directors for a mini sabbatical. And I was able to do that in my career. Uh, and it was wonderful. So think creatively about how you can make time because you cannot add hours to the day and you need to live your life. So, but this kind of activity can be fun and it's very important as academic currency. Strategies for writing. Um, I think reading is probably the best way of doing good writing. If you read things, uh, things of beauty, sometimes you become a better writer just because you know, you begin to love words. Uh, pick your target journal early so that you can tailor to that journal. Um, dictate sometimes if you're having trouble writing those words. You usually don't have trouble telling somebody what you're doing. So if, you can't, if writing is just a sticking point for you, dictate it. Um, I had one author who dictated an entire chap chapter for me. And I, it was astounding. Um, and the only way I found that out was because I asked where the references. You don't have the references in here. He said, oh, I'll put them in later. I dictated this in my car. <laughs> it was astounding. And it was great. It was wonderful. Um, create an outline. Some people work really well from outlines. So that's always something that can be helpful. And I've certainly given you some outline material that you can use. How many paragraphs in, is an introduction? Three. Three. Um, some forming writing groups. There's a good literature on writing groups that they are helpful in getting people to be more productive. So that can be another source of support and inspiration. And then make yourself a deadline and tell somebody about it. Okay. Um, finally, overcoming barriers. You have to have a good idea, a well-designed and executed study, and nobody helps you better than a biostatistician to get that to happen. So if you're doing any kind of quantitative study, get that person identified and on board as soon as possible. Make sure you are making a unique contribution in some way. So know the literature. Know where those gaps are so that your contribution can, in fact, be novel and unique. Find the right journal or two or three. So don't have one in mind, because then when you're rejected, you feel really sad. And you don't want to feel really sad. You just want to say, oh, well, you know, Take what you learned from it, use the reviewer comments, make it better, send it on. Um, have an internal reviewer or editor, and then don't accept no. Somebody will, t if, if your mentor has said this paper is a good paper, one of the journals is going to take it. You just have to find the right home. Be persistent. OK, any questions or final comments? So the question was about um, when to stop when you're looking at the literature, because it is endless. So I think that um, the best way to do that is the way you delimit uh, a PubMed search, for example. You go to core clinical journals to try to hone down, because when you first search on your topic, you have 2,347. And then when you put in you know, humans only, or you know, recent, and then core clinical journals. So you do the same kind of sifting when you're looking so that you don't get pulled into the vortex of endless data. Look at the most relevant journals. Look at the most relevant pieces. 
and come at the journal um, search with a question, a very well formulated question, and don't let yourself get too far off task. So I think what happens when we start to spin in the literature is when one thing leads to another, leads to another, and we're really interested, and it's kind of cool. If it's not relevant to your question, stop yourself, um, because otherwise you do get pulled into that vortex. So just try to stay on task, just the way we do with our learners in the clinic, where, you know, what is your question? And the focused on that question, and then you come up with much better answers, you come up with much better searches. Other questions? Excellent idea. So the idea is to get the journal information, make yourself a table so that you can look at the key things that you need to do for submission and use that to determine which journal is number one, two, and three, and to make it facilitate moving your paper to the next one if you get rejected. Okay, other thoughts or comments? Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me, and hope you got something out of this, and good writing. Thank you.